And welcome, everybody, to Inside the Scene, the show that explores the stories and topics of being professional in esports. We're on a quest for tips and insights on how people turn passion into more than just a hobby. I'm excited for today's show. Uh, we're going to be talking about averting, avoiding burnout in esports and being in professional gaming. And this is a topic that is pretty dear to me personally, just because I've had friends in esports who have just stopped playing. They've gotten pretty far in their career or whatever that situation may be, and they've had to give it up. They've had to quit uh, because of either injury or just because it's the, the schedules are too much. And I'm going to be, we're going to be today on this episode, exploring some of those things that lead up to that scenario and maybe what some things people out there can do to avoid it. If your aspirations is to be a pro player and you want to go the distance, you want like that climb is a long climb. And so you want to make the most of it once you get there. So without further ado, I have three guests on today to help me break that down. So. Well, we get started with, voila. All right. I am joined today with Dr. Kate McGee, Dr. Hey. M or the Gamer Doc, and Ishmael Pendazra. Hi everyone. Welcome everybody to the show. Um, I am super excited to have you here and let's, let's do a little bit of introductions. We'll go around the table um, and I'll do my little, what I know, and then you'll fill in the blanks. So let's start with you, Dr. Kate. Um, you're part of team one HP, which is a performance esports, uh, medicine practitioner group. And I actually know you more from smash brothers, but apparently you were around Dota. You're like, you know, eight high ground TV, uh, you know, what, what's, what's hip is my favorite character in esports, but uh tell me tell us a little bit about your history um so i did get my start um in dota with high ground tv um formerly owned by what is hip who now owns uh chaos cc um he's an absolute delight you're not wrong i love greg oh. <laughs> greg is, greg is a wonderful human being uh yeah. and he wiggle gif is a gift oh. to all mankind absolutely uh, oh my god <laughs> i do also work in in fighting games as well as uh in dota in league and csgo um i do uh, esports uh, medicine and performance direction for one hp i'm also the director of performance for exo academy which is a program that aims to get more women competing in kind of high tier fighting games, communities, competitions. Ooh, um, yeah. Also apologies for continuing to look down at my lap because it is currently filled with a cat who really would just like to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, and let's move on to Dr. M or the Gamer Doc. And you have a educational YouTube and Twitch website that helps people get right to be able to play longer, which is perfect for this conversation. Um, you're also on the board for Queer Women of Esports. So why don't you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, so my uh, my name is Dr. M. I am the face of Gamer Doc. I'm a licensed medical doctor um, who treats esports athletes and gamers. Uh, like you said, I'm also the president of Queer Women of Esports, a 501c3 dedicated to making competitive gaming more um, hospitable towards queer women. So I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dr. McGee's, you know, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and on this panel. What's up, Dr. M? <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. And so, Ishmael, you're part of uh, Mental Craft, which is also like a performance group that works with, uh, with also with esports. And you just recently are working with, uh, is it Chaos? Chaos. No. No. Uh, kind of with Rogue, you mean? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. see, that's bad host movement move there. It's okay. But you're a performance coach <laughs> and your favorite game is League of Legends. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ismael Pedraza. I come from Colombia, so I understand sometimes the accent at the end of my name could go in different directions, so. <laughs> but it's fine, it's fine. Um, so, so yeah, so at the moment, yes, uh, we developed this website, The Mental Craft, so that's how it started in eSports. So 
I come from traditional sports, so my background is in sports psychology. Um, so currently I'm doing my PhD in, uh, in sports psychology, in esports, directed to esports, but then at the same time I'm working with, uh, as a performance coach of uh, Rogue, which uh, we're competing Rogue. in League of Legends here in Europe. So, so yes, um, that's basically what I'm doing in esports. Um, and, and you used to work with Misfits. Is that right? I used to work with Misfits, so that was right, my, okay. my first gig, basically. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Oh, okay. Terrible. <laughs> my host, my host powers have failed me. But the thing is, I do know is having you guys here. I'm hoping to have a different perspective on burnout in esports and what that looks like to players currently in the space and up and coming players because. I'm sure we can all agree and understand that esports is becoming the hot new commodity in terms of professions for young people. Young people are going to want to get into esports. And I think there is a weird cloud of what that lifestyle it takes to be in esports, to, to maintain esports is, is all over the place. And that leads to, from my perspective, a lot of unhealthy habits that does not allow for a career to long last. So. Um, I am but one person and I, I am hoping that together, you guys here, as we have a conversation, we will be able to lift the cloud and figure out what, what people out there can do and what people are doing probably right now that does not allow for a long lasting career. So why don't we start off really easy, leading, leading causes for burnout. What are some of like the main causes from burnout? from your guys' experiences. Anyone can jump in. So there's there's some pretty decent understanding of what causes burnout in like traditional work structures that it really carries over pretty well to esports too. Um, and one of the biggest things is just a, a lack of control or perceived control over your situation um, with the degree of autonomy that you have. And in esports, sure, a lot of us came into esports because we didn't want the traditional structured fields that were available to us. Um, but at the same time, there's still a good deal of external structure involved, right? There's tournament scheduling, there's travel times, there's jet lag, which is imposed on you. There's, you know, when the competition <clears throat> season actually is, there's sponsor commitments, there's team commitments. Um, and so those things are not necessarily entirely within your control. Um, and then to add to those kind of more external structures, there's also the internal issues of what kinds of things are you doing that support your whole lifestyle? Um, in terms of sleep, movement, nutrition, social habits, that's another big one. Um, and, and really, of course, I'm gonna to defer to Ismail here because this is absolutely his area of expertise. Um, I my, my experience with burnout has been a lot more um, learning from written research as opposed to experiential practice. Um, so I'm gonna to toss it over to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, from my experience, like I think you summarize pretty much many of the issues in terms of burnout or the causes of burnout. And I think uh, we need to look into different contexts uh, from my applied experience. Like, uh, I think it's different, for example, if we look into League of Legends and then we compare it with Overwatch. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so League of Legends structure, I think uh, is different and the causes might be different, I believe. Um, but I think if we look into the bigger picture, causes of burnout in esports are part of like how esports has been built or how esports is in kind of in the perspective of this uh, uh, everyone who is involved in the scene right um, so it is much related to uh, unhealthy habits uh, or habits that are not common in for example if we compare it with traditional sports um, so i think it's more related to how the culture of teams are built uh, and then we can go more specifically in, in kind of what we're doing uh, in Rogue or what I'm doing with my applied practice. Um, but I, I pretty much would say like every case is different, every case is different, but then at the same time, we have very specific idea or we have ideas about- Like a general idea. Out. Yeah. Yes, what is born out and what causes it and how we can look at it or assess it. And, and then from there, what we can do about it. Doc, Dr. M, your thoughts? <clears throat> I think that um, you know both of them brought up excellent points. I see a lot of people who are on that border between being a gamer and being a, a, a pro esports athlete. Uh, I think 
there is a distinction, right? There's a distinction between being a gamer and there's a distinction between being an esports athlete. And that's why I like till the end of my day, we'll say that they're athletes because once you're once this is your career you have to approach it like it's your career right a lot of people they start like when they're 14 15 they start getting good at a game and then they grind that game and then their their aspiration is to join an org is to you know be the top of these tournaments um but they're not approaching it like you would a career right if you were a, a pro football player you have a training schedule you have a nutritionist um you take time to do things like VOD review, you take time to do things that aren't just directly practicing your craft. Uh, and so a lot of the, the thing, times I see burnout in that you know transitional population is because they're not training sm smart, right? They're not training effectively. They're mm -hmm. playing their game for 12 hours a day with no breaks. You do that for, for a year, you're, you're gonna hate it. You're gonna hate the game. Um, so, you know, treating, esports like what it is a respectable career um i think is is also really important there's and there's there's so many there's so many branches that can go into that because to me and there's like there's the physical aspect like physical injury which could lead to burnout and then there's like the mental aspect of leading to burnout yeah. uh but touching on your point dr m when it comes to that kind of structure whose onus is that is that the like org's onus to make sure that they take care of the players or is that like a player onus to take care of themselves like pro athletes have a team structure and they kind of look out for them and and you know someone who mm -hmm. like oversees them but like solo esports may not be so lucky and like you know whatever have you so what are your thoughts maybe on that or... i i i firmly believe that if you're an esports organization that has coaches and that has the resources um, you need to have a healthcare provider either as in a consulting fashion or full time. Um, if you, if esports wants to get taken as seriously as we treat other traditional sports, you need to give your players the same support that other professional athletes have. 100% esports organizations need healthcare providers on their team who are taking care of their athletes. Because if you're an esports owner, so say you're you know um, you own Complexity. You may not even know these things, right? But but you know you may not know the things medically, mentally that your players need. Um, so that's why you gotta you gotta hire someone, or you gotta get someone else in. We're talking about complexity specifically. They they do absolutely do that. They have a they have somebody for like mental health. Um, they've worked with me for physical health. They also <laughs> they're right across the street from um, a really great clinic that they've been able to make use of, and they share a campus with the Cowboys. So their players all have access to the same like nutritional stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's it's really awesome. It's really aspirational. But you don't have to be at that level of competition or even at that level of kind of intertwinedness with traditional sports to still get some really good benefits out of um, incorporating those what we've learned from traditional health uh, traditional sports structures as far as integrating health. Um, and like Dr. M said, it can be in a consulting capacity. Yeah. Um, the other thing too, is there, there are more and more resources that are out there for unaffiliated players. So for players who aren't with an organization who are training on their own currently, um, there's more and more content research, education resources that are available. Um, and while I totally get the impulse to get better at what you do by doing that specific thing. Um, if you if you can stop and take a breath and recognize that you know a football player doesn't just get better at football by running drills again and again, a football player in say their preseason will have three practices a day. One of them is for weightlifting. One of them is for or, sorry, weightlifting is separate actually. They have a weightlifting. They have a morning practice which is mostly conditioning. They have a midday practice which is mostly walkthroughs of like running patterns. Um, so you can kind of get used to them even when it's hot outside. And then evening is usually a scrimmage. Uh, so, and then after that, there's usually VOD review. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that go into competing at a high tier in a traditional sport that aren't just run yourself into the wall again and again with your specific activity. So if we don't expect people to get to the NFL by only playing football and never doing VOD review, weightlifting, consulting with a nutritionist, impacting their sleep, why would we ever possibly expect that somebody in competitive gaming would would get there by only ever gaming? Um, 
I think it's an interesting point. Like it's, I, it's doable is, to do. It's just oh, yeah. optimal and it does definitely lead to that risk of burnout. And I'm I'm with Dr. M as far as whether or not gamers are athletes. Um, and I would go further and say, I'll absolutely evangelize the case of, of you know, competitive gamers are absolutely esport athletes. But at the same time, to the to my medical peers who are skeptical of, of that term being applied to gamers, uh, my response would be, who the hell cares whether they're athletes <laughs> or not? If they're, if they're athletes, you treat them like athletes. If they're not athletes, great. They're a unique subpopulation with specific needs that you can address. Address them. Yeah. With the idea, though, of the even having that in professional sports, there's it's holistic in terms of how a person comes up versus in a in a weird way, almost esports is almost like luck to get into those levels. Like there's luck obviously involved, but even another layer of luck because um, if you don't have that kind of holistic, you know, upbringing into your your level of your craft, then do you get at the end at the end almost lopsided to where you need to be? Um, is that almost like a barrier to entry? Like, do you find that? from your experiences with other players that when they get to that pro level to get that kind of assistance, to get into an org that has, you know, these kind of services available to them, are they in a state where their bodies are already been run pretty ragged or they're already in a weird mental state and you have to kind of work backwards to kind of rebuild them? I mean, I think if I can, if I can give my input there, of I course. think this, this is part of the, the evolution of esports. So if we compare with traditional sports, so <laughs> they've been like, I don't know, over 50 years trying to understand how to train, how to practice, how to compete. And then at the same time, these issues of bur burnout have been studying already for more than 30 years, right? And we're not talking about coach, nor, we're not talking about players only or athletes, but as well coaches, right? Uh, and then, so the evolution of, of traditional sports have been taken for a long, long time. Esports were already including coaches, were including other experts, which this didn't happen before in traditional sport that fast. So I believe the structure of esports is like demanding, demanding, demanding more for from the organizations, from, oh, okay. from the players as well. And then like kind of for, for your question about like who is responsible more or less of this issue, I think it's both, right? We don't have a developmental path for for athletes for these esports mm -hmm. athletes to understand what burnout is or what learning or developing means in 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 this in this area so so i totally agree that uh, we need experts to help them to understand how they can practice how that how they can improve how can, can they master uh, their their craft um, but for that we still trying to catch up right um yeah. so so it is a combination of different factors that are already there because we not necessarily uh, will say that uh, burnout is only at the competitive level right we have already no, as yeah. well uh, i mean burnout is everyone we, we <laughs> yeah, you know in our professions we can we can as well suffer burnout right and yeah, this yeah. go in terms of mental health um so so there are many many uh, branches over there that uh, we need to look and we need to try to understand where where we can um, um, kind of consider our interventions or our approaches. Sometimes it will be like um, like organizations they just want short term rewards or like kind of they want the success very fast. So of course it doesn't matter if the player born out, they don't care. We just want to be a successful team or successful organization. Mm -hmm. There are other organizations that they they care more about the the players themselves like their their well-being so so that's why like we need to start educating those who are on the top and making decisions to help them to understand that if you have healthy players healthy coaches healthy people in your organization that will means in the long term um kind of success right which of course it, it's not going to happen only just by saying it like that but <laughs> it just directs us towards that uh, kind of Definitely. that idea of success I think so, Ismail is, is okay. like 100% correct. Um, esports is is new, right? It, this field is in its infancy still. You know, we've, we've come leaps and bounds in the past couple of years, but it's still new. And take League of Legends, for example. Um, speaking of Rogue, I love Kevin Naki. I listen to his podcast all the time. Mm -hmm. And he was talking the other day about how, you know, up until a couple of years ago, there weren't coaches, high level coaches available for League because the people who were that good were still playing. 
So now as those people retired, there oh, were coaches yeah. available. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, there's no framework for this. It's so new that we're all kind of figuring things out as we go along. And even if those resources exist, the players that, or the coaches or the CEOs might know, not know how to take advantage of those resources. I mean, like, so if you're, if you're on a professional soccer team, you know, you've been playing soccer since you were six years old, right? You've been on a soccer team since you were six years old, those like colored shirts that were oversized. Um, and then, yeah, you know, <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. You know, and then you get to middle school soccer and you finally get a uniform and then you get to high school soccer and your uniform might say your name on the back. And you've been playing soccer for years and years and years and years. And with it, you've, you've understood how to work with coaches. And as you move up through the ranks, you get a nutritionist, you get a strength and conditioning coach, you get an athletic trainer, you get a team doctor. It's slow, it's gradual. We don't have that in esports. So, you know, when you're six and you're playing video games, you know, I was bringing my N64 control over to my buddy's house. So all of a sudden you make it to an esports organization. And even if you're Jason Lake and you've got all the resources from complexity and you go to this player and you say, here is what we have for you. A lot of times they have no idea how to use those resources. No clue. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. That's so true because like that's uh, infrastructure for traditional mm -hmm. sports is baked in from PV leagues to mm -hmm. all the way up to high school, to college, to university, and then to professional. It's like a gradual step, but I didn't even really think about it. In esports, you're this, you know, you're, you're Mountain Dew and Red Bull all the yep. way till you reach pro level. And when mm -hmm. they're like, all right, here, you know, here's a gym, use it. And they're like, huh, why? <laughs> Why would I use the gym for? <laughs> yeah, That's I mean, no, sorry. Really important thing to consider too is that uh, there's things that we can take from traditional sports that are great, mm -hmm. but I don't want to lionize traditional sports to the extent that you know we disregard that there are serious issues and concerns to pay attention to there as well. For sure, esports is in a really uniquely equipped position to kind of take what we need. Um, from a whole bunch of different research areas. We can absolutely draw from the research that exists in traditional sports when it comes to things like, you know, periodization of training, practice scheduling, how to man manage things like jet lag, you know, how to develop team mm, communication, yeah. stuff like that. But we can also draw from other sources. We're not just limited to traditional sports as, you know, our, our go-to um, source of, of kind of modeling. We're able to draw from, as Ismail mentioned, the the research that exists in burnout in other work cultures. We're able to draw from research on things like uh, musicians, high level performers oh, who have to do yeah. small repetitive movements for long periods of time and have pretty long careers and in pretty competitive environments. Have you have you ever seen what the uh, tryouts are like for the first chair of a violin? Um, and then we can also draw from things like uh, research on air traffic controllers. That's a job that sits for a long period of time doing a cognitively demanding task. Uh, we don't have to just limit ourselves to what sports knows works for sports. We're able to say, here are the things from sports that we think might work for esports. We can try them out here, but we can also draw from this really rich, diverse base of knowledge. We don't have to be bound by these traditional structures. We can make new ones. I love that. I didn't even realize to think out, like, I always feel that even esports and myself, that we're just tunnel visioned, like, what is sports doing? How do we bring what sports doing and how do we like fit it in this model? But there's, there are a lot of other adjacent industries that we can pull these from. I didn't even think about music. Music's like a really good one. Like I was like, I feel like the competitive level of music and even the uh, age level of success or the threshold of success can, especially, you know, uh, like DJs and other kind of musicians as well that have that rising star, maybe fast burn, like fast fading, like, the other one that, I, that I'd really love to look into as a research source potentially is uh, something like the WWE. And oh. the reason for that is not because we've got the same level of physical demand, clearly, <laughs> but because of the degree to which, like, say, parasocial relationships are developing and encouraged between, you know, the competitors, the wrestlers, um, and their fans. Um, oh, the true. kind of balance of an on-screen slash in-game persona versus your out-of-game self. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, there are things about esports which are much more entertainment based, you know, looking at things like uh, competitive gamers streaming on Twitch for a living as well, um, tying in that entertainment aspect. I, I, there's actually not enough research on, on it in the WWE in the first place to talk about <laughs> it, but I think like talking to people who've worked in the WWE for a long period of time would also provide, provide us insights for esports. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I love the insights in terms of 
we need to learn or we need to try to apply what we what we know from other performance areas uh, so it, it cannot be limited to to just video gaming in general right there is lots of research in video gaming uh, but not at this level of performance although i would like to or what i like to say always is like we need to look into the context because what's been happening is and i think it was mentioned before yes you can tell the players to well uh, you can go to the gym the organizations are giving them gym memberships to players and coaches but then none of them have been in the gym before so what are they supposed to do, right? So, so you need to look as well into the context and how these people have built already knowledge about how to do things. Um, the same as one of the examples as well that um, I know about, mostly about performance coaches or sports psychologists working in Europe. Uh, at the beginning, like, I don't know, five years ago or something like that like there are people coming experts coming but as well they try to do everything very like very kind of similar to traditional sports so how okay. they used to work in soccer how they used to work with uh, basketball players or different athletes and they do the same in esports but then you need to look into the context and, and it's, it's not the same so you will be challenged with so many obstacles and, and with so many issues that you need to learn to adapt as well. So I think that combination between what has been done in other kind of performance areas and what do I have in front of us, which as well is really cool because it's new, right? So we are getting to understand better what we have in front of, in front of us. And then as well, we have the knowledge from other disciplines. Is there a, is there like a medical, like an esports medical community where you guys are able to like set like a standard so that you know there's a consistency across the board like it we're would be awesome but it could, it. okay it was like it's it's in the works we're working okay. on it uh, <laughs> because <laughs> you're working on it yeah there are no set guidelines or standards right. Okay. right now uh medically and i think the problem you know the reason why there isn't is because what ismail just said is that you know, right now the people coming in are 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 coming from traditional sports. You know, if right, right. esports it was is a billion dollar industry now, right? That's a lot of money and a lot of people, a lot of big businesses, a lot of people with business sense are getting involved in esports who aren't gamers. So mm. you have this kind of non-organic involvement by these large healthcare organizations who, um, you know, don't know a lot about gaming, don't know a lot of esports. There's no guidelines for them to follow. So they, you know, they take their one of their sports medicine doctors and they say, "Here, here's an esports team," you know. So it's it's definitely super hard. Um, I think that's why I, I, I'm encouraged by seeing, you know, Skillshot partner with um, Northside Hospital in Atlanta or MedStar partnering with Monumental or the Cleveland Clinic creating an esports practice. That's great. But you still need people who understand gaming and who understand right. esports involved because otherwise you're going to get the same old stuff from traditional sports and you're not going to get the insider perspective. So let's actually zero in now onto some things that, especially esports related. Um, carpal tunnel. I hear a lot from players. Myth, reality, or are people overblowing it? Tell me about this carpal tunnel, you guys. What, it's what's almost the situation? never. Doctor McGee's tunnel. angry. I can I can feel it. <laughs> she's she's got a lot Dr. to Ray say right now. Okay, so here's the thing. I see it on Twitter all the time. I got carpal Everybody tunnel guys. Everybody has hand pain and thinks they have carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel, if you have carpal tunnel, you'll have very specific symptoms. It'll affect the first three fingers. You'll get numbness and tingling. It'll be over the, the wrist itself. Um, it'll feel like burning, tingling, piercing, poking pain. If you have pain in the back of your hand, you either have the world's first case of posterior presenting carpal tunnel, in which case, come to me, I'm writing a case study on you, <laughs> or you don't have carpal tunnel. And in fact, you more likely have a repetitive yeah, strain injury, is. category of repetitive strain injury. It's called tendinopathies. Tendinopathies are just anything that can happen to a tendon. Um, tendons are most commonly injured when we overload them with strain before they're prepared to handle it. Um, think of it like the, the human body was not made to say, I don't know, bench press 500 pounds. Your human body at baseline probably couldn't do that. You could train your human body to do that and do just fine at it, but you needed to train to get there. You needed to build progressive load on those structures that needed to do the work. Same with gaming. No, it's not 500 pounds of, that you need to move, but the amount of force you're applying to those joints, tendons, muscles, ligaments even over time 
um, is a significant amount. So you need to adequately prepare those joints, tendons, ligaments, and muscles for it. Um, there are definitely times when nerve involvement is a thing. Um, carpal tunnel is a nerve injury. So is Guillain's canal. So is uh, ulnar stuff. So is uh, cubital fossa stuff. So is double crush syndrome. But those are all things that uh, you're more likely to get as a consequence of mm. other issues, um, whether they're postural issues or ergonomic issues oh. or compensations for pain that you're getting from, say, tendinopathy. Um, so if you think you have carpal tunnel, the odds are you probably don't, um, you might still have something else going under your hands though. And that's the thing worth addressing regardless of whether or not it's carpal tunnel, but please, for the love of God, media, please stop writing that gamers are at higher risk <laughs> for carpal tunnel. I disagree. Oh, <laughs> we all had this discussion before. I'm a big <laughs> fan of Dr. McGee. I think she's brilliant. I disagree. Oh. I think that in your under 35 population presenting with wrist and hand pain it's probably not carpal tunnel but as gaming continues to grow and as my generation ages we do things all day that put us at an increased risk of carpal tunnel we sit at desks we have terrible computer heights we have terrible ergonomics we're we're doing other things that predispose us to carpal tunnel and then we go home at night and we game and so People in their 40s, late 30s, early 50s, you might have carpal tunnel. I'm just saying. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> we don't we don't disagree on that one, Dr. M. Casual gamers and competitive gamers are susceptible to very different injuries. Oh. Um, okay. And the casual gamer, and that's why whenever I see one HP tweet about carpal tunnel, I just bite my tongue. Because I respect Dr. McGee, <laughs> and you know, and you but, know who we're talking to, as opposed yeah, to, and I know who you you're know. talking to, right? We're differentiating between that casual and competitive environment, right? And I tend, I tend to um, address the casual gaming population a lot more um, because, you know, I just that's just the reason why I got into this. So um, it sometimes is. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned we you mentioned five hundred pounds and training. Can you train your hand to with like to to with like are these tendons something that one can train and withstand that, or is this going to be over time? Like the more you game, eventually you're going to get breakdown no matter what. So breakdown is. Uh, hmm. I don't want to say breakdown is inevitable because breakdown is not <laughs> inevitable in the sense that you're describing it. Um, tissue changes over time. Um, and there's there's some component of age related change which impacts right. how much your tissues can further adapt. Um, the kind of short answer is the human body is remarkably adaptable um, and when the right progressive loads are placed on it can be trained to adapt to a whole bunch of things that it would struggle with otherwise. Okay that well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> We're, we're adaptable. We're adaptable in that. Pretty darn so, adaptable. And let's talk about- The progressive part of that is also important. If all you did was, um, I don't know, say, if you'd, all you did was 100 push-ups every single day, um, there would come a point when 100 push-ups was really easy for you. And doing 100 push-ups would not make you that much better than you already are. Um, same thing goes for, you know, training in gaming. Um, you could train last hitting in Dota um, for a really long period of time, and you're going to hit a point where training just last hitting in Dota isn't going to make you that much better at last hitting than you already are. Um, you need to progressively load your tissue the same way that you progressively train. Um, you need to build up the volume, the repetitions, the amount of weight placed, the amount of time you're holding it for. Those are the kinds of things that you can change to increase a load progressively, um, little by little over time. Uh, so kind of like a, this is, almost like weightlifting as well. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. This is brilliant. I need a doctor in my team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm available. <laughs> it, it's interesting though, because how the issue here is how can we help these pro players, for example, or these competitive players or aspiring competitive players to understand that this amount of repetition is not going to make the difference right because they have learned this way right mm -hmm. and, and then we have seen some cases already in comp at the competitive level with uh, hand raised issues uh, that has made them stop playing or retire 
Um, but then they are still thinking that the best way to improve is just by grinding. So oh, the grind. <laughs> it's it's very interesting to to. I think it's very crucial to try to understand or try to make them understand like kind of how they learn, how they improve, and what could happen if they do what, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, we're there for most time. A lot of players start off very young, very young, and and that. How do we, <laughs> or even, you know, maybe this is a completely different topic, but be careful not to go on too much of a tangent, but like, how do we even get them to understand at that age, the value of what they're doing is not giving them like diminishing returns in terms of like playing at, you know, the repetitive and it's not doing what they need them to do. So I, you know, whether that means being in the school system, stuff like that, because I don't know, short of finding YouTube how they would get that kind of information, so. But. This feels really timely to me because uh, this afternoon I was actually at, uh, I was on a Zoom call with the, the game gym in Potomac, Maryland. It's this, uh, it's like a boys and girls club, but for gaming, it's run Ooh. by Josh Hafkin. He's doing a great job, uh, you know, developing content. And so it's kids ages eight to 18. Right. Um, and he has Dr. McGee show up. He has me show up. and. And we talk, we just, you know, it's very right. minimal. It's it's the basics. It's, hey, you know, you should take breaks when you're gaming. Hey, um, when you eat food, make sure you include some protein. Make sure you drink water. It's it's the little habits at an early age that really help. Um, and I also think what we touched on earlier, you know, esports developing as a field, we're gonna have more resources later, right? We're getting high school esports programs. Pretty soon there's gonna be middle school esports programs. Pretty soon there's gonna be elementary school esports programs. And so having the resources um, and you have play things like um, the Varsity Esports Foundation, Play Versus, um, and nonprofits that are, their whole mission statement is helping organize, you know, high school, middle school esports programs and making them healthy. Uh, so I think it's going to, it's definitely going to come with time, but I agree, you know, how do you, you know, if you're, if you learn a thing for nine years and then nine years in someone's like, you should do it this way. They're going to be like, what do you mean? You know, I know how to do it. I'm 18. I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic one. <laughs> I wanted it. I want to also turn on some couple of key points that I want to get your guys' opinion on gaming chairs. Are they as ergonomic as people seem to think, or they're marketed as, like, are they contributing or are they just nothing, just myth and folly? All right, so the answer is it depends mostly. The answer is always okay. it depends. Um, but I literally just wrote an entire article on this because that Herman Miller chair made me yeah. nervous about things. Um, long story short, uh, as a general rule, the more adjustable something is, the more likely it is to be ergonomic for you and the for you is really important because a thing is only as ergonomic um, as it allows you to maintain good posture. Um, so for someone like me who is five foot two, gaming chairs suck for me. I have to sit with terrible posture because otherwise my feet don't touch the floor. Um, my two options are either slouch like this so my feet actually touch the ground or sit all the way back with my back supported but now my legs are slightly extended because they're running into the edge of the chair. Um, so for me, a gaming chair makes no sense. For someone who is a relatively average size, it might make more sense. Um, I think it is absolutely entirely possible um, to have an ergonomic gaming chair. I think it absolutely also already exists in good ergonomic form in traditional office chairs. Uh, they just might be a little less colorful. Um, as a general, about Herman Miller? Most, like when I've when I've worked with teams in the past, for the most part, I've recommended buying office chairs. Um, there's a couple gaming chairs out there that I like well enough to say, yeah, this one's good. Um, is the Herman Miller one, one of those? Oh yeah. The Herman Miller is, is an excellent ergonomic chair. You do not need to spend $1,500 to get an excellent ergonomic chair. You can, if you want to, I will not dissuade you. You're welcome to do it. It's your choice and your money, but you don't have to. There's other options. <laughs> I'm sitting in a Herman Miller office chair right now. I think uh, if you want the real answer, ask the experts what they're currently sitting in. Um, I think that, you know, where did gaming chairs come from? They were old racing chairs that they slapped a coat of paint on uh, and then marketed as gaming chairs. Uh, they tend to have a bucket seat, uh, which is terrible ergonomically. Um, and they, like, you know, Dr. McGee said, tend to have 
you know, poor ergonomics. Uh, I think, you know, as we grow as an industry, they're going to be better. But right now you're spending a lot more money on a lot less of a chair where you could just get a black chair like this that will support your back for a third of the price. Well, not with Herman Miller, but you know. <laughs> for, for the record, I sit in a $50 chair from Staples. Yeah, I've had it for three oh. years. It's great. So is it I, more like your posture and how you carry yourself rather than the chair itself and like your yes, body? Your chair posture. should enable good posture. Mm -hmm. right. You know, okay. your chair, your desk, the height of your monitors, the position of your mouse, the position of your keyboard, all of those things are only as ergonomic as they allow you to maintain good posture. Things being in a generally neutral position. Um, and when I say good posture, I mean two things. One, I mean, letting you stay in neutral positions comfortably. Um, you know, so your wrist is not tilted too far to one side or the other. Um, that, you know, your back is supported, now. you're able to sit upright, <laughs> but also that your setup allows you to move because your best posture isn't sitting up perfectly straight like a ballerina. Your best posture is your next posture. How continuously are you moving? Are you changing positions? Um, you'll find me sitting like this. You'll find me sitting cross-legged. You'll find me sitting with one leg propped up. Um, and I change oh, positions like every five minutes. This is the longest I've sat still in one single position in a really long time because I need to look professional right now. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't even think about it. I was, I was like, oh, I have to sit up super straight. But you, as long as you're able to move without taking a, a lot of it's really it's your... good. Moving is okay. even better. Ah. That's going to be a good sound bite. I'm going to keep that there. <laughs> <laughs> in your performance coach, from your perspective, how much is ergonomics weighing in when you're trying to get the best out of players? It depends. It depends on the player. It depends on... It depends. Yeah, there are so many depends. <laughs> I mean, um, you can you can notice sometimes players' posture is uh, it's kind of um, like it's it's very poor. So you can you can kind of uh, identify it. But the issue here is like, of course, I'm not an expert in ergonomics or the position of the hand. So I'm lacking I'm lacking of some knowledge in terms of how they should be sitting, right? Like, and of course, like there is these guidelines that uh, Dr. McGee was, 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 was mentioning, right? Like kind of we have a specific ways of, okay, it should be upright. It should be in this position, like kind of your, your feet should be kind of touching the floor. But then at the same time, uh, like for example, we have one, one issue with one of our players and he has uh, kind of pain in his wrist every now and then. Right, and it could be just because he has a weird position with his hand, right? So I have no idea about it. Um, so then we have to go to experts who who know about these, but kind of more specifically and what to do. Because from like kind of my position of performance coaching is more in the direction like it's more holistic, right? It's more like kind sure. of in terms of the culture of the team, in terms of how they are, um, kind of in terms of their mindset or the mentality or mm -hmm. doing exercise. So more like kind of in terms of very, very general. So if we go into very specific aspects of posture. So, well, we need to go more in detail, right? Um, yeah. Well, for that, I'm going to be very cognizant because I know Dr. McGee, you have to jump out really shortly. Um, so I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to keep going with the rest of you. If you're still okay to stay for a few more minutes and- I've got like five more minutes. All right, so we'll we'll take I'll take advantage of those five more minutes because I still have one key point I wanted to get through. Do you have one more a couple of minutes, Doctor McGee? Oh, I did not hear what that was. Oh, you muted. She's Kate. muted. Doctor McGee, still not working. There we go. No. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I can hang out for five more minutes. Let's do this. Okay. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. So what I really wanted one of the things I really wanted to tackle was travel. Travel is like super killer. Like a lot of players. Um, even Shroud has gone on, on to interview saying that he used to love travel and now he hates travel. Players are forced to travel for teams. And, well, not now, obviously, but in when esports gets back into live events, travel is. So what are your thoughts on players traveling? How can they make it more enjoyable and how can they reduce that from reduce, like wearing them down? So from my perspective, a big part of what affects um, travel for players is change in time zones um, and that kind of disruption of sleep and regular patterns. Um, so I think anything that teams and organizations can do to help their players with that transition, whether it's you know being able to travel to an area a longer period of time before the event happens so that they have more time to adjust to the time zone. Financially, that's not always an option. 
Um, so helping players understand kind of how sleep cycles work um, and what kind of things they can do to control their the quality and the quantity of their sleep um, definitely helps. Um, you can definitely use meals and kind of those external cues as a, as a way to help reset your rhythm. Um, so, you know, eating at what is the appropriate lunchtime in the new time zone, not necessarily what your body is hungry oh. for from your old time zone. Um, we can also use light as an excellent external cue. Um, so providing similar patterns when you're traveling can definitely be, help be helpful. Um, the other one is there's, there is such a thing as, as decisional fatigue, which is basically the... It, it's not saying you run out of willpower so much as it just, if you're having to decide a lot of different things, you have less mental energy to spend on other stuff. Um, so if you have to decide, if you have to figure out how you're going to travel to a tournament venue, as well as what you're going to eat that day, on mm. top of all the in-game decisions you're going to have to made, make, that's more stressful than just being able to focus on your in-game decisions and somebody else manages the travel, the hotel, the food, etc. cetera. Uh, like a mental fatigue, like a, like a decision, exactly. like, like, oh, like so many decision points and you just run out of them. Anyone else want to tackle onto them? I could, I could add that I think it's important to have preparation, to prepare what's going to happen, what it's in your hands and what is not, right? So this is as well like kind of performance, like when they compete, there are things that you can control, there are others that you cannot control. Uh, so preparing for the trips are very important. But then something that I feel is very crucial uh, is one, like kind of education in those areas of, for example, a sleep cycle. Uh, I don't know the type of nutrition that you will find or why it's important to drink water. So I think just very simple aspects of psychoeducation, like what we call it, are very important. And then based on that, I think um, working a lot in terms of routines yeah. for basically to minimize this this mental fatigue or mental effort that they will mental and physical effort that will that they will go through so if you get to establish in your organization or in your players uh, different strategies to reduce this fatigue so it will be easier for them to adapt when they go to a different country or when they just travel somewhere else because you make sure that these routines are still in place even though you're in a different place and different mm. context so exactly. I think it's uh, it's it's very very crucial to have specific routines already established. Dr. M, I, I completely agree. I, I the routines are so important. Having some sort of that's why having some sort of schedule that you stick to prior to tournament day is so important, right? If you're going to go practice, you wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, um, you work out, and then you go to your practice. You know, the day of. A, I, I played uh, semi-professional rugby. So like the day of my games, I'd wake up, I'd eat the same thing every morning. I'd listen to the same music and I'd do the same routine prior to going to the game. I'd warm up the same way. And that way my brain and my body were ready and said, it's time to compete. And so when you're traveling, making sure that, you know, even if you're in a different time zone, you still wake up and you have something similar to eat and you, you, you have that workout routine um, and you do, you listen to the same music, you, you still inject a little bit of normalcy, a little bit of routine. In that um, time zone or your own time zone? How, like, what is the better? No matter where you are, like having the same routine, you know, yeah. ha having the same cues around you uh, right. can be really important. Okay, so we're going to wrap up. I realize now that this was actually a very, very big topic for my little, little, little time slot. So I'm going to actually put it out there that we're going to hopefully one day do a part two to this because there are like, there's a, this is a very, very, very big topic. And I love this conversation. It was beautiful. So to finish it off, I'm going to give you guys one last thing and you just point on it. You have a billboard and it, that billboard is seen by players all around the world. What would you put on it to help them avoid burnout? Uh, Dr. McGee, would you like to start? <laughs> For crying out loud, get better sleep. Ah, uh, Dr. M? Take yourself as seriously as you want other people to take you. Ooh. Ismail? I would say awareness of your surroundings and yourself. I love it. Absolutely love it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this was part one, hopefully. But even if it's not, this was a lot of great information and hopefully down the road in a future episode, we'll come back around because man, there are a lot of things to a, to be cognizant of for your mental health, physical health, and being in this journey of being in esports. Sure. So, and 
till next time, guys, if there is anything you guys would like to have in, in terms of comments and questions and queries for this episode or future episodes, put something in the comments below. And we'll see you next time on Inside the Sea. Peter. <laughs> <laughs>